everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. For everyone who's catching the replay, uh, I forgot to hit record before uh, doing the entire uh, uh, Zoom. So we do have a lot of it recorded, but I want to do quick introductions. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin. I am a urologist who did her fellowship training in sexual medicine. So I see all genders for all types of sexual health concerns and problems. Uh, I started my practice about seven months ago, and my goal is just to improve people's quality of life any way that I can through evidence-based medicine, through really comprehensive multidisciplinary care. I really like spending time with people. Uh, I think we can't truly improve your quality of life unless we understand what it is that you want out of life. And so I'm so excited to have this event for you today where my friend Dr. Carrie Leff is going to really help us dig deep and understand uh, how to talk to our kids about sex and really through all ages. This thing that we never got uh, very good information from our parents who got even worse information from their parents. So how can we do better for the next generation? I want to introduce you to the wonderful Andrea Martin sitting next to me who uh, mm -hmm. came to work with me uh, and is so passionate about um, uh, empowering young adults. And she's passionate about uh, women's health. She's really uh, excited about sexual medicine and how we can just do more in our practice. So why don't you introduce yourself, Andrea? Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to meet you. So excited to be part of this practice. Again, my name is Andrea Martin. I am a women's health nurse practitioner. I can take care of all genders. I have experience in gynecology, urogynecology, family planning. So, so excited to be here. Um, some of the things you might want to come see me in the office for is we're doing consent-focused GYN exams. So instead of that super rushed, um, uncomfortable GYN exam where you don't even know what's going on and they're talking to you while you're naked under a sheet, you know, we don't do any of that. We Nice and slow and take things at your own pace. Um, also super excited about our young adult education and empowerment uh, visits. Uh, so excited about this because I'm pretty sure most of us have had terrible uh, sexual education experiences if you've gotten anything at all. Um, so this is kind of my way of helping you as a parent with starting these conversations, preparing your kids throughout their childhood and their adolescence. And there's you know, I know as a parent, sometimes it can be a little nerve wracking to bring these things up. So let me start or let me help um, kind of delve into that conversation more. There's really nothing they can say that's going to throw me off. So I'm so excited to talk to kids. And we're so excited to have uh, this event for you today. So please enjoy. I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. Carrie Left. She is an internist and pediatrician. She is the co-author of uh, several books, including Celebrate Your Body Too. And she started a company called Turning Teen that really does help to provide virtual education, sex education as well. So we're so excited to have her. Please enjoy. If you like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, follow us on social media, uh, and please come to the practice and join us. And we're happy to help you years and about um six or six plus years ago now um i started a company with a colleague who's a fellow pediatrician um called turning teen and basically my kids are a little bit older than rachel's and my oldest was about eight at the time and the whole reason that we decided to start turning teen is that we actually didn't really know how to have great conversations with our kids about their body and about um, their sexual health despite being pediatricians because it's actually not what we're trained in so the when you said all that like when we imagined turning teen the first time that we sat down we like had this brainchild that we would have groups of we always thought of moms and daughters sitting in a room together learning about their bodies and so every time we go and do our programs it's always like a little bit of a moment because it totally came to reality. And so that was the reason that we started. People were asking us, you know, how to talk to their kids. And then in the office, we were a little bit uncomfortable too. So we just were like, let's just figure it out, do it. Um, I love that. That is so wonderful. And so everyone check out, we'll put in the chat box, um, her website and the information on um, the, to do the virtual events. And so um, Dr. Left, tell us, let's go through each age group and let's talk about 
what are the things, because it, we, we don't want to say the same things to the three-year-old that we're going to say to the 18-year-old. So how, you know, this idea that we have the talk, right? Just one talk, we get it over with in one talk, like, like bust that myth for us. And then let's talk through each age group of what are three pearls or three things that have been the most beneficial for you as a pediatrician and an internist. I love that you're both of those things because you see the talk sort of every at every stage of life. So, yeah, so I don't, the sex talk is not a talk. It's just a continued conversation throughout life. And the best way that I could say is that I think that people envision a sex talk as being like, let's say one 30 minute conversation. And we like to say that it's 31 minute conversations. Like they can be quick, they can be informal. You might not have the exact right answer you know, off the tip of your tongue, but it doesn't have to be this like awkward, let's sit down, let's be like face to face. And it um, doesn't have to be like a what we call the cold open, like where the kid never comes up to you and you just sit down like today, right now, we're gonna talk about sex, honey. That's not really what we like to do. So the whole idea is to just be able to have hard conversations throughout your child's life and start when they're really young. I also don't want to intimidate anyone who has older children to say that you're too late or you can't get started. Start as young as your children are right now with age appropriate information. But the whole message is just that like, you're, if your kid asks you like really any conversation question, it doesn't have to just be about sex, like that you're going to answer them. You're going to actually give them an answer and you're going to give them like an open and honest answer. And they know that you're not going to tell them like an untruth. Right. So I think that we always say that like the most well-intentioned parents, like just don't know what to say. So they don't say anything at all. And when you don't say anything at all, when your kid asks you some truth about life, you basically tell them like, Hey, I'm not going to be able to be your resource for this information. So you're going to have to search for that information elsewhere. And when your children search for that information elsewhere, they're gonna to go to the internet or they're gonna to go to the playground kid or something else. And I promise you, whatever you say is 8 million times better than those two resources. And then they're gonna keep coming back to you because they know you're not gonna tell them something that's not true. So I kind of think about it as, in order to desensitize sort of myself or parents, because I think they, we attach all of this like sexuality to talking about sex to our kids. But I think we should just like get rid of all that because our kids don't have this context of sexuality like we have. We just need to think about it like animal behavior. Like we're talking about how our species reproduces. And if we didn't do this, we become extinct like the dinosaurs. And when you go to the zoo and you see two animals mating, you could be like, well, they're making a new animal. And it always takes a part from a man and a part from a woman to make a new animal animal. I suppose there's probably animals that maybe don't, but I don't know, but at least in people. Um, so, so you can kind of describe it in very like more scientific terms as they're younger. And I think that makes it less embarrassing or less, you know, like tachycardia inducing heart rate <laughs> elevation inducing for parents. And the younger that you start, the more practice you'll get. Your younger kids are never going to correct you, right? If you say something wrong, or if you don't get the words right. And so I think- you clearly have not met my children, uh, Dr. Leff. Uh, What's that? I said, you haven't met my children. They correct me all the time. Um, oh, okay. That's fine too, you know, like laugh about it. it some of it is kind of tough, you know, but um, the younger, the better because it's easier as you go forward. And people think that that's crazy. We always say like, you know, you think it's time to stop and sit down and have a sex talk with a child at about age eight. And most parents, when we tell them that are like, oh no, my kid's not ready. And your, your, your child like doesn't have to be sort of ready to understand like how new humans are made. Like they might not be ready to learn like English, but they do, you know, like we have to kind of get them where they need to be. And so, um, yeah, starting young is really important. So, so young kid, do you want me to start with ages? Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Go okay, ahead. So start with the start with how young you know uh, the babies, the toddlers. Uh, give me three. Give us three tips, three things that you think uh, we can start doing today. Okay, so the youngest kids, like zero to four, like you know, we start with basically like some talking points and points of conversation are just like boys and girls are different, and boys and girls have different party body parts. We're actually most 
exactly the same, but boys have penises and girls have vaginas or vulvas, Rachel will want me to say. Thank you. Um, and so kids start learning their body parts at around 18 months. We teach them their eyes and their nose and their ears, and we should include their other personal parts, Rachel, personal parts, like not, we don't have to call them private parts because that does add a little bit of shame, I think. So using the word personal parts is like something that I like to. I use. like that so, personal yeah. parts. Yeah. It's no shame, no shame in this game. Okay. So then potty training is also a bodily function and part of sexual health education, right? Anything our body does like is part of our sexual health education. So if your body has snot or tears or poop or whatever, like we don't have to be like, ooh, that's so yucky. Like our bodies are not yucky and that helps to introduce shame. So just like, isn't it so amazing? Like your pee is coming out of your urethra. I mean, you can use I have whatever. a pot. That was my potty training song was pee from the urethra goes in the potty. And my kids would sing that all the time. And like, <laughs> they know where their urethras are. That's a urologist child though. But yeah, keep- for sure. For okay, sure. I love that. But I like the sense of like wonderment, like it's pretty cool. How does our body like do all this? It's so amazing. And um, that's kind of the tone that I like to take. Um, breastfeeding or uh, somebody in the family who's pregnant is a really good way to just say like, babies grow in mommy's uteruses or, you know, and um, that's the way that a baby is gonna come into the world. Or, you know, you don't necessarily have to introduce how a baby is made necessarily at that age and they won't necessarily ask. But, um, you know, that's a good talking point too. breastfeeding is like another point of wonderment for the body and things that we do that are, that's amazing. And then because most parents don't have this language that just falls off the tip of their tongue, I think that books are just so great. Um, and such a great resource for parents to have at home and in each age group. So if you let me share my screen, um, I will, um, I don't know. I can show you some resources. I would love it. That would be super helpful. And you should be able to share your screen. And I'm going to put a plug for Dr. Carrie Leff. She uh, co-authored this book, Celebrate Your Body Too. Okay. Yeah, we'll Um, get to that. Like we're going to, we're going to go with the young kids. All right. This is for the young kids. (laughs) Um, Oh, here we go. Okay. So here's my resources, ages zero to four, a little slide here. Can you see this? Um, Mm -hmm. We can make it full screen. Hit, hit, um, Slideshow. Okay, there, there we go. go. So um, the first one is What Makes a Baby. Corey Silverberg has a series of books that I'm going to go through as we go through these. And he's really great. And they're all like very gender inclusive and very sort of probably not this What Makes a Baby, but the other ones are. And he's a really good author and just came out with a new book. It's Not the Stork is the first in a series of books um, by Robbie Harris, which is Rachel, I don't know how you learned about your sexual health, but the way that I did was through a book that was in my parents' library called What's Happening to Me, where there was a sperm with a bow tie and really awkward sort of brown (laughs) people that were on top of each other. That was the cartoon book when I was growing up. It's the Robbie Harris books are like the new version of that. So it's not the stork is for the youngest of kids. And then I'll go through, oh, actually, I'm sorry. You know what? That's wrong. The the one on the side is the youngest. Who has what is the first one. It's not the stork is the second one. And I'll go through the rest. Todd Parr, this is just a book about different families. Oops, sorry, I got somewhere bad. Um, And then here's some websites. Amaze is a great website. um, And Amaze Junior is for the younger kids. So that's my zero to four. I love it. Yeah. So let's go. Let's go. So I've got one of those uh, and then I got one in the next age group. So let's go to the next okay. age group. Talk to me about, you know, all genders. What are things? And, and I love the mm-hmm. idea that we should be talking about all genders to all genders, right? Like, like we must teach the boys what tampons look like. We must teach the boys, you know, how periods work and, and, and what a vulva is and things like that. So talk to us about this age group. So ages four to six, we just kind of step it up a little bit. Same conversations. I'm going to maybe unshare this. Hold on one second. Can you see me or no? Yep. Okay. Um, So we step it up. You're still sharing. Sorry. Still sharing. Okay. One second. Oh, stop share. Okay. There you go. Um, So we step it up a little bit in the ages four to six range and continue with the same conversations. Like conversations around pregnancy though, can like go a little bit further. Like 
you can teach children how babies are grow and how they're born, but you can also tell them like, you know, babies are going to come out through the tunnel that goes through the out to the outside of the body. That tunnel is called the vagina. So it helps to like, you know, kind of teach anatomy. I think that that's really helpful. Um, again, the zoo is probably my favorite place to talk about sexual health because it's just less sexuality for people. And, um, so, you know, use that because you're going to be there. It takes a part from a male and a part from a female to make a baby. Um, safety in ages four to six is very um, important. And so um, talking to kids about bodily autonomy and that their body and all of its parts belong to them is um, a really important empowerment, you know, type of um, thing. We never have to um, have, allow somebody to touch or see our body that we're not comfortable with. And it doesn't have to be scary, but it should definitely be said, you know, explicitly. And then also like we sometimes talk about this idea between the difference between secrets and surprises and just tell our kids like we don't keep secrets um, in our family. If something's really exciting, we might keep a surprise that's going to be revealed later, but we don't keep secrets. So if someone tells you to keep a secret, that's not okay. Ooh, I love that. That's a really wonderful, um, nuanced way to kind of do it. Yeah. It's surprise good. versus secret. Yeah. And um, let's see, what else should I say about this? Um, again, books. So let me just, you know, books are the best to help parents because this is just hard stuff, you know, and we don't have to do it on our own. Like it was already like, this was already made for us. Like we can make it easier. So let me go with, we're going to make an Amazon wish list. Uh, so to put out, so we can put all these resources for people. Cause I think the more resources we share, the more we talk about this, the more, you know, I wish that we had this and financial education sort of as the mm -hmm. same, you know, starting from a I young age, that teaching kids about money, why are these things so secretive and difficult to talk about when yet you're an adult? I'm an adult. I just started my own business. And it's like, why don't I know, you know, some basic financial education? I've made it this far. And so I'll make it big for us, but make it into a um, oh, okay. screen so we can see. So talk to us. Yeah. About this a little bit more. Okay, so um, this is, these are the books ages four to six. And the other thing I'll say is like when kids ask you questions, if you have these books at home already and you feel like you don't have the words, we always say that like, just take like a Snickers moment. Like if your kid asks you, well, how is a baby made? Maybe not at four to six, but like you can just say like, you know, maybe you're washing and doing the dishes or something and you just are sort of shocked that your kid asks you a question. You can say, this is a really important question. I really want to answer this, but I'm going to take a minute. And the most important thing is that you have to get back to them and go back to answer the question. And at that time, bring the book if you don't have the answers off the tip of your tongue and go to the chapter that they asked you about and just read it together. You don't have to even have the words that way. Somebody's already done it for you. You know, I think it's so funny that you say that because my own kids have started asking me these questions. And so you're like geared up, ready to like give them. They're like, I got this. This is what I do. I can do this. And so I start answering it. And then they're on to the next question, you know, and then they're like on to the next question and like, which is totally random and separate. And I was like, hmm, is this a learning moment that I should focus on it or let the conversation just go, you know, where it goes? Like how important is it to grab them at that moment? Did I miss, did I, did I miss an opportunity? No, I actually think it might be the opposite. So the more like we get, like we're nerds and we get super excited if our kid would ask us something like this. And then if we like go into like a whole lecture about how the entire body works and maybe it takes too long, that is also going to be a deterrent to them coming back to us. Yeah. It's too much, right? So if they say, give me an example of a question that someone said to you that you want to give all your information. I think just I've gotten recently, right? The how are babies made? Mm -hmm. I heard at the playground it was a special hug. Okay. Let's talk oh, about so that. Like a sex Let's question. talk about that special hug. Yeah. Really so first of all, you could say, like, well, yeah, make sure you clarify like what they know <laughs> and why they're asking, you know, because that's really important. Sometimes we answer the wrong question and they're like, oh no, that is not even what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, the second thing is that you could say, you know, like I said, I always say this: it takes a part from a man and a part from a woman to make a baby. And then if they're really asking, like, how does that work? you know, in heterosexual sex, again, this is a little heteronormative to, I'm just going to say that to start when kids are young, that may not be exactly the correct answer, but it is hard, I think, to go with the other layers. I think it's just important to understand the basics for kids 
at least to start first, that understand that it's still going to always take a part from a man and a part from a woman to make a baby. So if they're talking about heterosexual sex, you can always say something like super simple, like, well, when men and women are going to make a baby, a penis goes inside a vagina and that's how a sperm meets an egg. Like it has nothing to do with sexuality. It could yeah. literally be that straightforward. They may ask you more. They might then run off. And then later that night, you could be like, I really liked your question. I want to get, read this chapter of this book. And then you can like sit down and talk about it. The, the rule exception to the 31 minute conversations is having like an explicit sex talk that could last like 30 minutes when your kid is ready by reading that book and just starting that conversation. But some of the stuff can be like really quick and informal. So tell us more about the next age group because I feel like, I personally feel like it's so much easier when they're younger and they're cute. And you know, a lot of times their questions are kind of simple. Like you said, they may run off. But now the next age group is when they're really kind of like pondering these things more and might want more in-depth answers. Like in after four to six? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so this is seven to 11. Okay. And so seven to 11 is like a really important teaching time because that is the time that we really need to prepare and teach kids to know about their body. So it's really heavy on puberty education. Um, we should, we think that we should prepare kids for puberty before they go through puberty. We prepare kids to go to kindergarten before they go. And so we need to do the same thing when their entire body is going to become from like a child to an adult. Right. So we should explain like what's normal and what they can expect to happen before it happens. And, you know, we have classes from Turning Teen that we do. They're like parent-child education classes where we sit down for two hours and we, you know, kind of go through it in a really fun and modern kind of way. So it's, it's quite different than in school. And we let kids ask anonymous questions and we'll answer basically anything that they ask. And so I think if you have something like that, we do virtual classes, I think that would be great. If you feel like you can handle that on your own, you can take any of the many books that there are and read them. But also just talking again in this thing, like just talking about, you know, your clothing that you're wearing, right? If your daughter is getting breast buds, you know, going to get the proper bra or whatever to, is part of a puberty conversation. Like your body's going to be changing. Your nipples are changing and your friend's nipples might not be the same as yours. They might not be at the same age, the same stage, but everybody's body develops when it's right for them. And you're all going to get to the same point in the end. And what's happening to you is totally normal. Even if they're first, you know, that's totally normal. Everybody. Yeah, I, I think it must be quite, you know, I love this idea of puberty education and, and this, this idea we pay for, you know, college prep. We, we talk oh. about, you know, investing in, you know, they, they, they do sports. We, we, we do piano lessons, right? This idea of having someone really exactly. like warn you, having the, you know, warn you what's going to happen. Like your body is going to transform. I get mad that we don't have the menopause conversations with people of like your, your body's oh. going to change, right? So we need to be having these conversations mm-hmm. in uh, everyday life. In of course, you know, schools can do a little bit, but let's be real. Everyone remembers their own, you know, you don't remember sex education from that one class in middle school that you might get. And so is there a space to come to, you know, a a medical office, a doctor's office to have those questions, to warn you what's going to happen? And can we prevent some of that body shame and stigma that goes out there? The boys whose penises are growing of what's normal. I see this on, I just saw this video that Johnny showed me and like, my penis doesn't look like that, right? Or my, like, I have hair on my vulva now. I am horrified uh, by this. That's not what, you know, this celebrity looks like. So I, I must be broken, right? How do we prevent a seven and eight and, you know, 10 year old from feeling those things? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack with what you just said, but um, I totally agree. Um, we need to do a better job. It will really help, um, I think, maybe put some of the sexual dysfunction, you know, out of business, like for the next generation, which is what we all want. The main thing that I was going to say that uh, as a reflection of what you just said is just that, you know, you have, we have these memories and we never know what memories our kids are going to have, but I can tell you that conversations that you have with your kids that are honest and open will really have meaning to them like long term and it actually I, the way that I think about it is it actually can change like the course of like your family for generations imagine if you did this so well for your kids and then imagine that they could even improve upon that in the next generation 
Like it's really a service to your family. And just remember like your school or turning teen can try and I, I can teach you the fundamentals of like, you know, how pubic hair grows or like what's going to happen to your breasts as they grow. But the most, the reason why parents need to engage in this conversation is because it's about family values. And this is for the next age group, maybe, but like, you want to be the one who's going to talk about this so that you can let your kids know, like, here's what we believe. And I can't teach you that. Um, but I want that message to come from me for my kids. And so as they get older, when we want to um, tell our kids about our values, we need to have been able to have those conversations earlier. That is so important. And I love the way you put it like that. So anything else for the seven to 11 age group? Oh, that so we periods and oh, period yeah. care, obviously huge media, just like, you know, pointing out that not all bodies look the same. And this isn't, you know, there's lots actually, of if you eat that hamburger, your body will look like that. Like <laughs> oh, that actually, okay. that's a medical, that's a medical fact. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, teaching kids in puberty about self-care, like teaching um, kids um, ab about how to take care of their bodies that you need to shower every day. We need to start washing our hair. We need to take care of our skin and our, uh, all that self-care is really, really important. And sometimes it needs to be explicit in this age group for both boys and girls. I have a lot of parents who come into the office and they like whisper to me on the way out, can you tell her that she needs to shower every day? <laughs> so, I yeah, have a, a kind of a specific question for you. I can't remember the exact age when most kids are exposed to porn for the first time. I think it's 11 or 12. So maybe yeah. like end of this age group, beginning of next. So like you want to prepare them for this, but how do you kind of finagle that you're not you know, startling or scaring or, you know, a kid that maybe never heard of it or doesn't even know what porn is versus like trying to make sure that you prepare them for being exposed to that. Yes. Um, I have some porn resources here that I'll show. And um, they're the most commonly, um, the most common book I would say that people reference is this is called, I have like an entire shelf of book. It's mm -hmm. called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't actually really like it. There's a lot of porn shaming in this book. So this actually wouldn't be my choice, but this is the one that if you go, they reference all the time. Um, and so I don't, you know, the question of whether you, like how you can introduce porn in this age group is like a good one. But I think that the whole thing is like, maybe just saying something like, you know, on online, you may run into something that you could have never imagined. And you might be like, shocked and if you see something that seems inappropriate to you like I'd love like I would love to talk to you about it or let me know you know or something you know there's kids can definitely trip over things that are inappropriate but I think it's be if you're open to conversations that they'll probably come to you and let you know I mean they're definitely it's common to trip over an image it's probably not that common to um, be really searching and looking for porn in that mm -hmm. age group but it but it happens and I think just being open about it you know I think it's more like the inappropriate content, like even that's on YouTube, that might not be explicitly yeah. sexual, but it might have um, things that you don't want um, your kids to see, per se. Yeah. Um, I'm having a little trouble. I was going to show you this. I'm. Let's see. Are you not? You're not seeing my screen, though, right? Not yet. Click to exit full screen. Okay. Um, hold on. I was going to show you. So there's a lot of good websites, though, that I can show you for porn that might be um, that are better than the book. Um, let's see. Here we go. Um, I'll make this big, too. OK, so these are the best websites um, for for porn conversation. This is maybe not exactly this age group, but this one called the Porn Conversation is excellent. There's three downloadable um, like PDFs that are free, highly recommend. Um, it's actually uh, created by a woman who's like a, a producer of um, ethical porn. I'm not sure if you know what that is, but we can talk about mm -hmm. that. And um, she has daughters. And so she wanted to know how she was going to like figure out how to talk to her daughters about what she did. And um, these are her conversation guides. And so those are really, really good. Um, Amaze.org again has information and give the talk is another one that um, you should check out. So I, I like those better than the other book that I was showing you.
All right, um, keep going. So good. Now start going into. Uh, I want to have time for questions uh, from people. So start uh, put it, coming up with your questions and putting them in the chat box. I know there's a lot of people on this call and people catching the replay who've got teenagers, right? The dreaded teenagers. Uh, so take us through uh, sort of that. Finish up that seven to eleven, and let's start talking. Okay, so these are the resources seven to eleven to check out. Our book is here. Celebrate your body too. That's for girls ages ten and up. Some of my favorites, sex is a funny word, highly recommend. That's another Corey Silverberg book that is really um, modern and explains everything about gender and different and people all look different and act, I, I love it. Um, so here's adolescence. Um, we talked a little bit about the Snickers moment. Sometimes we all need to like take a minute and breathe when our teenager asks us a question. We might not be ready for it, but we can do it. And the most important thing is getting back to them. So me, I love media as a talking point. You know, if you can watch a movie and you're in your living room with your kids, you can talk about consent and you can talk about boundaries and you can talk about what's happening in that scene. And does she seem into it? Does that seem like, okay, is, are the messages that they're giving to each other, does, do those make sense? Or what would you do in this situation? Um, there's so many opportunities. Sometimes parents want to leave the room or like, shrivel up and hide during those scenes but those scenes are the breakthrough moments with your kids um and then the hardest thing about having teens is that you do need to be a little bit vulnerable in order for to keep your credibility right if you're constantly um lecturing about things and you're never willing to share anything about yourself i think that it builds a little bit of a wall you want your kids to be vulnerable with you and share things you have to share things too. Now, I'm not talking about sort of explicitly sharing like sexual, you know, things that happen maybe between you and your spouse or something like that, but there's going to be questions that they're going to ask you. And I, I can give you some examples of how to answer them. So for example, like when you tell your kids about sex the first time, but this is the younger age group in eight, they'll turn to you and they'll say, so you and dad did that. And then you say, yep, we did. That's how we make a baby. And then they'll say, so you have had sex three times because you have three kids? That's the next question always. And you can say, no, you know, people have sex for different reasons. Sometimes we have sex to make a baby, but most of the time people have sex because it feels good or because um, it helps bring them closer together. There's lots of different reasons to have sex, but sex is something that happens between two adults. That's it. Oh, like, you make it so easy. Yeah. Do you want to come into everybody's house to just like yeah. be around that, you know, in case these things come up? Yeah, but stop. That's what I'm saying. Like you want to go on a whole lecture, just stop. Sex is something that happens between two adults. That's not okay. Um, and then uh, anything, you know, in adolescence, like you have your pick of all things um, that are happening in our world to talk to your kids about your values and whatever your values are, you should talk to them about this. And so it's always easier to talk about other people. So talk about, you know, what you feel about what's going on with abortion. You know, you don't have to, if you had an abortion, you may or may not share that with your child, but you can definitely share what your thoughts are about it. And so when you talk about somebody else, whether it's someone else on the screen or what's happening legally, it can be really meaningful and it can be easier. I love that. All right. Oh, do you want, uh, I love this. Can I go play? ahead? I love it. Yeah, go ahead. Let's see if it plays. Okay. It's like a minute. This is a TikToker. I love TikTok. Mm, we might not get it. Oh, here I just go. wanted to talk to you about picking your sexual partners. I know that we've already talked about the functionality of sex, how to be safe, the different reasons people have sex, and getting to know yourself intimately. So I wanted to tell you the traits that I personally value in my sexual partners. But before I say anything, I want to make sure you understand that as long as you are happy, healthy, safe, and consenting, who you choose to have sex with is entirely your decision. Above all else, I value three traits in a sexual partner. The first is knowing that they won't forfeit my pleasure, which if you are having sex with someone who does not think that your pleasure is as important as their own, they're not a good sexual partner. The second most important thing, in my opinion, is finding someone that you're comfortable with, you know, someone that you can laugh with, someone that you're not worried about how you look with, um, because it really just makes the act more enjoyable. And the third thing that I would look for in a sexual partner personally is someone that I trust. I want to trust them to respect my boundaries. I want to trust them not to turn around and tell all their friends the next day what happened between us. 
I want to trust them in case something happens, like an unplanned pregnancy. Because even if you are using contraceptives, an unplanned pregnancy can happen. Again, these are the traits that are important to me, but I understand if you have different traits that you're going to value. Any questions? And so um, that's a so representation good. of a very nice TikTok video. So how can you, <laughs> how can you, like these kids are all sharing and watching and seeing things and you obviously there's probably no control. I imagine it's so much harder today than it used to be. So what do you do when it's like the opposite of that or way terrible? Well, I think one thing, so, so we talk a little, a lot about media, like in turning teen, but I think one thing that parents, can you see me or can you just see my screen? I see the screen. I see you a little bit, but unshare your screen so we can. Okay. So I think one thing that you can do is, and that parents don't really know, and you probably know as a business owner on both Instagram and TikTok, you can have multiple accounts. Okay. And so the reason why I'm mentioning that is because you can have other accounts and you can follow your children's accounts by putting them on your phone. And that will allow you to know exactly what your children are seeing. And so you may or may not wanna control that, meaning you can unfollow, but it's also just very helpful to know what's being presented to them because then you can sort of let them know like what, that, what they're seeing may or may not be true or how that's influencing them may not be great. And so I think that's one like little clue that can be really, really helpful. But even my teens, you know, like, I, I have a very, I don't do TikTok that much, but I have a TikTok video that says birth control will not make your boobs bigger because like my daughter says, like, even to me, and I'm like a women's health physician, like, mom, are you sure um, <laughs> birth control doesn't make your boobs bigger? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. But pu And I, the like, next thing I said, but puberty does. So mm. don't believe everything on TikTok, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, but there are, and then the other way to counteract bad information on TikTok, and I do this all day long, Rachel, and I'm not sure if you do, is I give my teenagers good information, good resources for TikTok, even, um, which can be really, really helpful. So you, I like to send them to people who I really like, like Jennifer Lincoln and Natalie Crawford and Allison Rogers yeah. and Emily Roach. And there's, Lots of great people with great information. And if you can get on the right side of TikTok with some of these people, they're really good. The wrong side of TikTok though is dangerous because on the For You page, it presents them with the same similar content over and over. And that's why I, I, that's why both of us, I know, yell and scream about getting more people that we know are the good guys out there and screaming because your voice matters. Like we are drowning in a sea of garbage and misinformation. And so the physicians and, and the, uh, the clinicians and the mental health professionals and the physical therapists, we need to get loud because we need to spread more good information out there. Um, uh, we, oh, Dr. Hart is asking for a list of those TikTok accounts that she likes, maybe that you like, maybe we'll come up with a list. If you I want. have a list right here. I just of got course she does. This is Dr. Course. Carrie Leff, everyone. She right, is. I gotta, I'm just going to share my screen again, and then I'm going to give you the list. So keep going with the questions. All right. So let's ask a few questions. So everyone go to the chat box, everyone give their thumbs up or go to the chat. This has been so wonderful. If you like this, we'll do more of it. So just let us know, give us feedback. Um, okay. So we're going to get a question. I got a question it says nowadays what is the average age that kids are having sex for the first time it's great to say that sex is something that adults do but it just doesn't seem realistic um you know i probably haven't looked at that data um recently but there's like a, so many good websites that 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 data is accessible one's called seekus S oh that's up here s-e-i-c-u-s it probably has it um and so what was the question on so, that? Uh, so if we're telling kids don't have sex till you're an adult and well, we had sex okay. when we were much less than adults potentially. So what, like what, how do we actually talk about well, I think about you should this? tell younger kids, Young that, kids. That, that sex is for two consenting adults. That's for like a school age child. When you mm -hmm. start to get to, you know, teenage years, I think it's important to understand that, that that adolescents can be having sex and be realistic about it. And like the reason why I like that woman, Emily Roach so much is she's super realistic about it. Like, Hey, I'm not here to judge you about what you're doing, but I want to be realistic. And here's how I'm going to teach you how to, um, you know, understand boundaries and consent and, but who you decide to have sex with is really up to you, but making sure to like not bury your head in the sand. If your kid's in a relationship, 
understand that maybe they're not going to share everything with you right away, which is fine. Like you don't share everything with them, but ultimately at the end of the day, at least for my, I have three daughters. What I want for my daughters is for them to be protected from sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy. But not only that, I want their heart to be protected. I want them to understand what a healthy relationship looks like and, um, feel safe and protected. So one of the things that I say to some of my teen patients is, you know, we often tell them don't have sex. You need to use a condom or whatever. Sometimes I'll ask them if they're in a relationship and they haven't had sex, I say, well, what, how would you know when you're ready to have sex? So I just have, I'll turn that back to you. What kinds of things would you want to tell your kids about how they would know if they were ready to have sex? Cause I have a couple of answers, but I'd love to hear from you what you could tell them. Okay, unshare the screen so we can start asking questions. Okay. Um, do you want to take yep. one? Yeah, so we have um, someone wants to know if you have done any type of research or um, kind of gotten feedback from parents or their kids about how these conversations have gone and what uh, what have you learned from that feedback? So we do anonymous questions at the end of all of our sessions. So we get built into all of our sessions. Like we pretty much know what people are going to be asking. So we always build that information back into the program. So that's often really helpful. And we have every question that we've ever been asked on note cards. And then the second thing that we do is we have a survey afterwards. And there's lots of feedback that we get. To, there's people who come up to me in restaurants in my own town and they'll be like, oh my gosh, the other day I put in a tampon with my daughter and it went so well because we talked about you the whole time. <laughs> the other day I had somebody who talked to their kid about shaving before camp. And I told her like, Dr. Left says we need to talk about this together. We should probably use the electric razor first. I mean, yeah, that's, that's like, that's everything. <laughs> I love that. I love that. All right, people, let's get to the questions. Go to the chat box here. Um, I want to reiterate, I'm so grateful, Dr. Leff, um, uh, for meeting with us. We are starting uh, our, our own little version of sex ed in our clinic. Uh, Andrea uh, is going to be seeing uh, teens, young adults, kids for body empowerment and body knowledge and being a safe place for people to ask questions and maybe coming, you know, every couple of years to check in and to say, okay, what questions do you have? It's not to replace the conversations that you're having with your kids, but we all know kids, there's something weird about talking with your parents about certain things. And so is there a space you get uh, your period, you're going through puberty, you need another place to just learn about your own body. And so we need more of this, not less of this as, as uh, we're, we're hearing right now. We have a question, how do you approach cultural barriers to having these important conversations? I love that question. I think it's so important. It's a great question. So cultural barriers are tough. And that's why like we call turning teens start the conversation. Like I'm just here to teach you like sort of the basics at least to start. And, and then I want you to go home and like have a jumping off point to have the conversations that um, with your values and in inserting your cultural sort of beliefs into those conversations because I'm definitely not knowledgeable about all cultures. So I think it's really part of turning teen is like empowering, empowering parents to hear how I talk about it. And maybe it could just destigmatize it for them a little bit too. So we have uh, someone else wanted to, going back to that previous question about, you know, saying that adults have sex versus acknowledging that teens do. How do you gear that information towards a middle schooler um, not saying that they should be having sex, but like that's something that might be happening, you know, amongst them or their friends once they get into high school. Yeah. So I think, you know, we talked a little bit about what's heteronormative versus more in inclusive. And I think one more inclusive definition of sex is like that sex is really anything that's done for like erotic pleasure. So in that situation, like middle schoolers that are engaging in for in play, any kind of play. Oh, sorry. That's my husband. Um, okay, Rand, I gotta go. Um, uh, that are engaging in any kind of play. I mean, that is sexual activity. And so I think it's important to acknowledge that like, you know, all of that stuff still counts and to have conversations around it. I think that um, being honest, like with your kids means, you know, saying that I understand that you're gonna have sexual thoughts. Sexual thoughts is when you're going into puberty and you have hormones, are like are normal. You're supposed to, that's how your body's programmed. Our bodies are so well programmed, right, Rachel? Like we have hormones because we need to drive. My husband does not know I'm doing this. I cannot talk, I'm on a live. 
Um, so, um, no, I think that's, it's right. Like we see that all the time. I actually love this, this um, meme that I saw was, you know, we, when, when adults are having problems with libido and problems and, you know, everyone says, well, oh, you need more conversation and you need a deeper connection. And it's all about emotions. We don't say that with teenagers. We say they're horny teens that can't keep their hands off of each other. So why are hormones important when they're, you know, teenagers, but when you become an adult, they're no longer important. So there is a biopsychosocialness of all of this. And so we focus, you know, of course, I focus a lot on the biology in the grown up part of things, but it, it starts there. And sort of you have so many people who come to me with low libido said, man, I haven't had a high libido since I was, you know, 17, 18, and it was raging. And I want that back again. Right. And, and, and they remember that they, they really do. And I think another important point you brought up about is that it's not just penis and vagina that equals sex. And that's something that we're trying to hammer home, even in adults. Um, again, anything that brings- well, that helps with our definitions of intimacy, especially if we have any of the problems that Rachel and I talk yeah. about. It's like sex is not only penetrative intercourse. Let's make it about all these things. Let's talk about like erotic, you know, kind of thoughts. And, you know, also like in teens, you know, it's important to say like, Hey, like people have sexual thoughts and that's okay. Your first and probably best sexual partner as a teen is yourself. <laughs> oh, I love that. Say that for the people in the back of the room. Um, okay, Dr. Love, I, as you, I want you to pull up the book resources for the 12 and up. Uh, we forgot to put that up. And then while you're pulling that up, I'm going to give you double duty to say, what is good language for that kid, that eight-year-old who just cannot keep his hands out of his pants, right? It, uh, <laughs> there is a constant need for that soothing. Now, I will say there are some younger kids, and we see adults as well, who actually have medical issues called persistent genital arousal, where they they actually feel uh, discomfort or arousal or symptoms. Obviously, the norm is just the kid who can't keep their hands out of their pants, but sometimes there are medical conditions that can lead to that. So don't always assume it's just, you know, there, maybe talk to a doctor sometimes to really gauge further questions, but that's just my doctor hat of like, I see conditions that people said, I've had this since I was a young kid. Um, so what would you say about that eight-year-old who can't keep his hands out of his pants? that like, that's normal. And um, if you want to touch your personal parts, that's fine. It's just like, we don't do that in public. So you're like, I think you should go up to your room if you feel like that's soothing for you. But what if you have a kid who's just not social then and would rather be in his room touching his personal parts than interacting with humans? So I think that that is then a little like, uh, uh, it's kind of, well, for, for, like persistent masturbation, like somebody who's like masturbating all the time. And this has nothing to do with porn. I would say that that is like a little bit of like a red flag. Like maybe if someone's spending that much time alone, that there's other resources that they're using when they're young. Um, I, I, I don't find that in kids that it's like excessive. Of course, there are people that it would be like that. But I think as long as you're not shaming it, like you know, it's totally normal and fine. And kids will sit there with their hands down their pants. And I think that we add shame when we, when we um, add those conversations. So try to avoid it, especially in the young kids and just tell them that it's something they can do in their room alone. And it feels good. Do you have those resources, those books for 12 and up? Oh, yeah. yeah, you had it up. You got to share put it, it up. You want me to do it? Again? I put it up one more time um, okay. so I can take a picture. All right. Any other questions that people have? We're going to finish up here. So if you have a, a, a question in the chat box, this has been so incredible. Um, and I'm just so grateful that we. Oh, uh, here's, I want one more thing. Let me yeah. show you the resources for parents. That was up there, but um, this is a little bit about, sorry. Your influence matters. Here's some good parent books too. This is so wonderful. Thank you so much. I think this is gonna be really helpful. Um, like you said, it, it's not just one single talk. It's, you know, it's starting and doing little bits at a time. So sometimes people I think don't even know like where the heck do I start? So all these resources are gonna be really helpful. So Carrie, yeah. where do people find you? So you can find me at turningteen.com. Um, and if you have any interest in like doing a virtual course, like where we set it up for a group, you just do info at turning teen. And then I'm on Instagram at Dr. Carrie Leff is probably uh, my most active platform, D-R-C-A-R-R-I-E-L-E-F-F. -F. Wonderful. Um, yeah, what? That's so fabulous. And um, you can find us at rachelrubinmd.com. 
Uh, my social media is dr rachel rubin andrea's social media is andrea explains it all she's hilarious actually um and so uh i would love for everyone to join us uh, on the uh, social media and help promote us uh i also uh, would love for you to send us uh uh let us help you have the sex talk we have openings in august before school starts uh 45 minutes give it a try see how your um teen or young adult or child feels um just having a space to learn about these things it is age appropriate and and focused on we meet your 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 teen where they are. We're not here to put our, our beliefs, but really to slowly introduce these topics in a very non-threatening, uh, empowering a way, any way that we can. So I think uh, that that's a really important message. Like parents get a little scared to hear someone else is going to talk to their kid about sex. And so I think it's really important that we keep it very like factual and uh, like evidence-based and non-judgmental, because I think then when we just give the facts that it's um, we let the parents do the, the family values part and that's what it should be. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for anyone on the replay. Let us know if you have questions, we'll come back and answer them. Uh, everyone have a wonderful weekend and thank you so much, Dr. Leth. Thanks, Rach. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.